Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 437 for Tuesday, the 2nd of February, 2016. Nice to see you. I'm flying solo tonight. My name's Robbie. I am your camera guy, your host, your co-host, your chat room operator, and your news dude. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the show. I'm going to try to keep up with uh, everybody who's joining us in the chat room. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm going to come back to the chat room. So, hey, if you're new here, let me know uh, before the next couple of minutes time. First of all, tonight we are celebrating the uh, 20 years of the GNU Image Manipulation Program as we continue our series. 20 weeks of GIMP tips. And uh, tonight we're going to be uh, going through an exercise to help us learn how to create perspectives in the free GNU Image Manipulation Program. Also, we are going to be reinstalling Raspbian on our Raspberry Pi, and this time we're going to extend the file system to use the entire 16 gig micro SD card. That's going to give us a lot more space for our uh, Raspberry Pi powered server. We're building a web server. Okay, jumping over here. Let's see if I can do it. See how that's done? Here is what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Europe has begun to roll out a data superhighway in orbit above the Earth. A Cambridge startup thinks that they have the solution to bulk password theft. A meeting of the EU data watchdogs is set to have wide-ranging ramifications for the way businesses handle data. And a driverless car project in the UK has received a green light and a bunch of government funding. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. My name is Robbie, and it's so good to have you here flying solo tonight. Uh, Jeff wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it, and by the time he said, yeah, I can make it, I had already got everything kind of set up and planned out for the evening. We've got a lot to cover. Um, so... Uh, it's just me. I thought, hey, let's let's go at this kind of old school style. So if you've been watching Category 5 Technology TV for some time, uh, you know that uh, when I first started this thing, it was just me sitting in the basement. Now it's me sitting in a TV studio and you uh, hanging out with me. So thanks for being here. And I hope that you enjoy the show. Speaking of shows, uh, Mangle Fox 70 is watching the chat room. She's here in the studio with me, keeping me company. And she just shot another episode of The Pixel shadow uh, check that out of course you can find the link on our website but also uh, just go over to youtube and use the hashtag the pixel shadow it's all one word and if you're on roku or cody uh, make sure you've got our channel installed category 5 tv network cody it's uh, at github.com slash cat 5 tv and uh, you will see the pixel shadow as well as our other shows uh, there. Speaking of other shows, um, I want to say I appreciate everybody who's been supporting Category 5, the TV network here uh, for the past while. We've been slowly building up our following on Patreon, and Patreon's a really cool way that you can support us. Uh, just head on over to patreon.com slash category5 patreon.com slash category five and through that website you're actually able to support everything that we do here at the category five tv network so there's uh my show the flagship show category five technology tv the show show new every day the category five tv newsroom try it by nature sounds of ontario canada the drone zone the pixel shadow creation today and more coming soon all you have to do is click on that pledge 25 cents per episode. Uh, or, of course, if you can do more, we greatly appreciate those of you who are pledging a dollar, three dollars, five dollars. It makes a very significant difference and uh, helps us to get to our goal uh, a lot faster. Now, we've got a lot of bills to pay rent, uh, internet. Um, we're volunteers here, so I don't take a paycheck, and neither do any of our co hosts or, or the people that actually make this happen for you. 
And uh, so we do our best to make ends meet and uh, pay for uh, the studio space that we have here in beautiful Barrie, Ontario. And uh, we also have our internet connection that is LTE and unfortunately quite pricey. And uh, we're broadcasting to you live tonight through that internet connection. And uh, we appreciate everybody's support in helping us to keep that going and keep that strong. Uh, Another way that people are supporting us is through our partners. You can go to our website and click on to support us and our partner links and through those partner links like Amazon, eBay, uh, a vast variety of others, uh, you're able to make your purchases and can and actually support Category 5 with a portion of your purchase. Uh, Amazon is probably the biggest of, of those as far as what, you, what our viewers are using and what you're using, and uh, I appreciate you doing that. And so we actually get a percentage of every sale. It's really interesting how it works because it's a referral program, and uh, as a partner of Amazon, we're, uh, we support Amazon.ca, .com, .co.uk, a whole bunch of other ones. So, hey, whatever Amazon that you use, please uh, make sure you go through our website, Category 5. Dot .tv very cool way to support what we're doing. Okay. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Let's get right into it. Uh, we've got the 20 weeks of GIMP tips. It's week 11, if you can believe, already. Uh, we are only nine episodes away from the end of that series. I know that you've been enjoying it, and uh, we appreciate all the comments that you've been sending in to say, hey, I love it. Thanks for doing the GIMP. And some of you have never even heard of the GNU Image Manipulation Program. Maybe you're a Photoshop user, or maybe you have uh, you haven't got a piece of software that is as robust as Photoshop or the GIMP. And uh, here's your opportunity to get something for free. It is GIMP.org. And on that website, you can download it for Mac, Linux, and Windows. So with the GIMP, what is it? GIMP. What does it stand for? GNU, Image Manipulation Program. It's basically a free alternative to Adobe Photoshop, a very pricey piece of software. So you can pay lots or pay zero. GIMP is absolutely free. Uh, If you're running Linux, you'll find it in your repositories. Just do a quick search uh, through your favorite package manager, be it Synaptic Package Manager or Yast or whatever you're using. Uh, Search for GIMP. Okay, tonight we are looking at creating perspective. Not the kind of perspective that, uh, you know, like what you see. Um, Yeah, I think I know what I mean. The kind of perspective when you look out over a horizon. That's the kind of perspective that we're looking at tonight. So, GNU Image Manipulation Program, bring it up on your screen. It looks a little something like that. I'm running 2.8. And uh, this is being broadcast in 2016, so depending on when you're watching this, we'll rule whether or not that is current. 2.9 is, uh, I believe, release candidate status, or at least in, uh, in some form of beta. Okay, let's create a new canvas. And what we're doing tonight with this tutorial on learning pr- how to create perspective is, uh, and, and through the whole series, through this 20 weeks of GIMP tips, what I'm trying to accomplish for you and what I'm trying to help you achieve is just learning the interface, learning how to do things in GIMP so that you're not afraid of the interface, so you're not uh, lost in the interface, but that through these tutorials, so think of this as an exercise, you're actually learning how to do some cool things so that you can do other things. So what I'm about to show you may not be something that you are ever going to need, but if you follow along, so bring up the GNU Image Manipulation Program, follow the, uh, the steps that I'm going to show you, you're going to be building your abilities within the GNU Image Manipulation Program, and that's going to help you to be able to uh, do some really cool edits that are going to impress your family and friends. Over in the GNU Image Manipulation Program, you right-click and go File, new and it asks you the size of the canvas that you would like Uh, so that is in pixels if you're doing it for print you might do it in inches or whatever you need to do we'll just use pixels and uh, it's defaulting to a little low resolution image which is just fine that's a little four over three almost uh, image okay so First of all, what we want to do with our perspective is create a horizon. And what that means is that we're going to have, uh, when you're looking out over a horizon, you've got that kind of, 
horizontal line. You've got the sky in the background, and then you've got this plane in front of you. So as we're creating perspective, let's first of all choose with the rectangle marquee, aka rectangle select tool. We can highlight a kind of a rectangle at the bottom here and drag to scale it however we like. So we can bring it just a little below the halfway point here and then choose uh, as our foreground, let's grab a, uh, a gray. I'm going to grab a f not too dark of a gray. There's B0, 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 Bob, Bob, Bo. There we go. So now my colors, I've got gray and white. So with this highlighted, I'm going to, and it doesn't matter if it's highlighted right yet, but let's create a new layer because we don't want to work on our background layer. We're going to work on this new layer here. So with this marquee created, I'm going to drag my mouse. And you can see we've learned the gradient tool before, but as I drag, I can do all different angles. But what we're actually looking to do, I'm going to grab up about here, drag down, and hold my left control key to lock it so that that horizon is going to be a, a perfect 90 degree. There we go. So we start to get this kind of look of a horizon. There you have it. So if I turn off the background, that is what we just created. That's my background at this point. So now let's go back to our background layer here. And again, we're going to use the gradient tool and we're going to create another horizon or another gradient, I should say. But this one is going to intercept with that first one. See that? And I'm just working in black and white right now. You might say, hey, this is actually a sky, so let's use a nice light blue, and you can do that. There you have it. We're not doing anything specific. It's not a, a picture of a sky or anything like that. Uh, I'm just creating um, the effect. ba 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 bo Easy to remember, right? There we go. So there's my kind of horizon. So with the layer that has my actual horizon, so we'll call it the ground, let's just blur that a little bit. So we're going to, and by doing that effectively, because it's a gradient, it's not going to blur the actual horizon. It's going to blur this edge so that it's not quite so stark. We don't need it to be quite so sharp. So right click, filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and notice that the layer of this horizon is selected. So as I choose Gaussian blur, you'll see it's actually just changing the edging just to make it a little bit softer. Let's try it at eight pixels. And that may be different depending on your image. So that just softens it up a little bit. We can also change the opacity by dragging this slider here. So you get your cursor in there and you can drag to make it softer, a little more transparent or 100% um, opaque. So if I bring that down a little bit, it gives a more subtle effect. There we have it. Um, so now that's just a little bit softer. Now let's grab some text and we're gonna, with our text tool here, I'm gonna highlight an area over the horizon and we're gonna type in GIMP. And you'll see that it's, uh, it's text there in black, uh, in gray, um, so it's not really showing up. I've highlighted it and changed it to black. And I'm going to increase the font size with this button up here. Okay, And that's probably just fine. So now I can use my Move tool and drag that to an appropriate spot on my horizon. So our background is fairly uh, dark. It's, uh, it's gray. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this font to a white font. So I've used my font tool, highlight all by clicking and then control A, or you can, of course, drag. Uh, and then click on the color, change it to white, and then I end up with that. So now we need to make it stand out just a little bit better. So I'm just going to click on the rectangle tool just to unselect the, uh, the text. And I'm going to right click. Um, notice I've got my text layer highlighted. Right click and go filters. And we're going to go light and shadow, drop shadow. Let's set our offsets to zero. We don't need it to be offset left and right or up and down. Um, so this is just going to be a bit of a black blurred shadow that 
surrounds the entire thing almost like a border. I'm going to turn off allow resizing because we don't want it to actually resize our image. And we can change the opacity. This is the opacity of the shadow itself. Now we can leave that as is, but we can always change it as we're after we're finished. So I'm going to hit OK and you'll see that effect. So what it does is it just helps that text to kind of pop out a little bit. So as I was saying, you can change the drop shadows um, opacity afterward if you want, because what it does is it creates a layer called drop shadow. So now I can say, okay, let's bring it up to 100%. Let's bring it down to 19%. And you can see the difference that that makes. So it's a bit of a, a soft border on that. So now to in, uh, continue to improve our perspective, let's grab our uh, ellipse select tool. It looks like a circle marquee and drag in this kind of a shape right under there. And if you don't get it in the right spot, don't worry, you can move it around. So I'm going to put that right below the word GIMP. And you'll see which layer I have selected. It's this one, my horizon. And I'm going to create a new layer at this point. Layer, new layer, transparency, Edit, fill, uh, I don't want the gray, I want a black. Because this is a bit of a shadow under the under GIMP. So right click, edit, fill with foreground color, it's black now. So this falls under the drop shadow and the word GIMP, but over this layer here. If you accidentally have the wrong layer selected, you might end up with something like that and say, oh, well, why is that? Well, because we set the opacity of the of this layer to only 73. If it was higher, I wouldn't see that at all. See that? So then you can drag your layer to the right order. If it's in the wrong spot over your text, you can then drag it under the text. Okay, so now again, I'm going to right click on the uh, layer with this circle, the black circle that I've created here, uh, and go filters. And I can either click on repeat drop shadow if I want the same amount, eight pixels, or I can go blur. Gaussian blur, and I can create an even softer edge by choosing something like 15. That's going to really soften that up. So now, bring down the opacity of that, and I end up with just a nice soft kind of shadow underneath the text. Now I can move that around if I like to help improve the effect. And there we have it. So we end up with a, a pretty nice effect. So now the next, the last final thing that I might want to do is just say, okay, while well, the text being absolutely white is a little bit boring, let's lock the al alpha channel, which is going to allow us to color in anything that is solid on this layer. And I can then grab my uh, gradient tool. I can, I can choose a, a soft gray and the white is fine. And then if I drag, you'll see what it does is it actually just fills in the text only. If I forget to, to click the lock alpha layer, which is this square up here in the top right of your screen, if I forget to turn that on and I've got the GIMP layer selected, then what's going to happen is it's going to fill in that whole area. Okay, so what I need to do is turn that on, then drag with my mouse if you'd like, hold in the control key so that it snaps to a perfect 90 degree, and then you can create the effect that you're looking for. Do keep in mind that by doing this, so I've created uh, this, uh, I've locked the alpha layer and then I've changed the color of the font using a gradient. By doing it that, by doing that I've now effectively rendered the, uh, the text. So I can no longer edit that text, it's no longer text, it's now a, a raster graphic. So by that I mean, okay, if I select the text tool and then I click on GIMP, it's going to say you're going to change this back to text if you click edit. So if I click edit, Watch what happens to the color. It goes back to white. So we want to just be mindful of that. So you can create uh, copies of your layers if you like, if you're going to need to make changes and things like that. But that is the GNU Image Manipulation Program. It's absolutely free for you, and we can do all kinds of cool effects. And that is a simple uh, exercise just to help us to understand some of the tools that are at our disposal with the GNU Image Manipulation Program. You can pick up your free copy at GIMP.org and get it for uh, Linux, Mac, or Windows. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat room. Nice to see you folks. I uh, want to say congratulations, a huge congratulations to Dave Maydu, longtime uh, viewer. Uh, he and his girlfriend have just welcomed uh, Ollie James, their baby boy, into the world. And uh, everyone's doing well, and we're pleased with that. Uh, Dave, 
congratulations, man, uh, to you and your growing family. Uh, so, chat room, nice to see you. Whiskey Zero's there. We've got uh, Good Guy 98 nice to see you again. Sparkly Ball's also there. Uh, nice to see you. Fairly active chat room, looks like. Bitfox, hey, water bottle. All right. I'm Robbie Ferguson, and here are the top stories from the Category 5.TV newsroom. Europe has begun to roll out a data superhighway in orbit above the Earth. The first node in the network is a telecommunications satellite that was launched from Kazakhstan. It will use a laser to gather pictures of the planet taken by other spacecraft and then relay them back to the ground. One benefit will be to put information on natural disasters, such as flooding, earthquakes, uh, into the hands of emergency responders far faster than is previously possible. Currently, it can take hours to get the pictures down to Earth uh, from observation satellites. Part of the reason of the, uh, for that is because the spacecraft can only transmit when they are uh, passing over a receiving dish. And in a 90-minute orbit, they only have about a 10-minute window. The European Space Agency's answers is, uh, answer is to fire the pictures upward instead via a laser to another satellite much higher in the sky, and that one has a constant view of the ground station. The agency uh, recently put up two Earth observers that are equipped with optical transmission equ equipment. Uh, these will now be able to offload their data through the new relay satellite, which is going to be positioned 36,000 kilometers above the equator at 9 degrees east. With a successful connection, data will uh, move at a rate of up to 1.8 gigabits per second. Testing by Airbus Defense and Space shows it should be possible for the system to put pictures on the desk of the people who need them within 20 minutes of those images being acquired. A British firm that claims to have come up with a solution to the issue of bulk password theft has announced £1 million in funding to launch its product. Silicon Safe. They have designed a special box. It's a piece of hardware which stores passwords separate to the network. Last year, there were high-profile hacks from firms including TalkTalk, Talk, Ashley Madison, VTech, and all of those exposed millions of users' passwords. The founders of Silicon Safe, Dr. Will Harwood and Roger Gross, initially came up with the solution, dubbed Password Protect, as an academic exercise. They quickly saw that there was a commercial potential for their idea. Now, software is prone to bugs and flaws, so their first step was to design bespoke hardware, effectively hard-coding a chip, and uh, making sure that it did not run an operating system or any other conventional software, and this design, the founders claim, uh, makes it impenetrable uh, via conventional attack routes. The box is designed to be secure and has only one purpose, specifically to store passwords. It runs on just 10,000 lines of code, far less than for a back-end database, for example, where passwords are normally stored. There is no conventional interface with the back-end systems, although it does allow web servers to send login credentials to the system in order to authenticate passwords, but it does not, in fact, at any point reveal those passwords. Dr. Harwood admits that hackers able to gain access to the back-end database of organizations could interrogate the box, but he has built in a safety feature. After just four attempts to authenticate the password, the account will be flagged, and system administrators will be notified. The Cambridge startup remains confident in its solution, and last year it launched a hacker challenge inviting anyone to steal 100 unencrypted passwords from the system. To date, over 2.5 million attempts have been made, but none have been successful. Could it be the answer? It's like an endpoint piece of hardware for passwords. Kind of cool. And just to kind of understand how that could work, so how does it work, right? So when you create a password, you are sending your password to that box. And so now you've got an account and the password says, okay, we've got Robbie's account. So next time I go to log in, my computer then again sends my password to that box in a secure way. The box now responds with a yes or no. 
It doesn't ever send back my password. So for somebody to exploit that, I mean, what could they possibly get? Because it's not responding with my password. It's not saying, oh, yeah, your password is 1234. No, it's saying yeah, yay or nay is the one that you entered correct. So sounds like it could be, uh, it could be pretty viable. Could be a good idea. We'll see. All right. A meeting of EU data watchdogs is set to have wide-ranging ramifications for the way businesses handle data. The EU forbids its citizens' personal data from being sent to places that don't guarantee adequate privacy protections. In order to avoid this restriction bogging down transfers to the U.S., it was decided that American firms could self-certify that information sent to their data centers uh, so that it would be uh, to confirm or at least to uh, ensure or say that that data would be properly protected. The pact made it relatively easy for companies to send personal information from Europe to data centers in the U.S. for processing, but in light of information exposed by Edward Snowden, an Austrian privacy campaigner had asked Ireland's data regulators to audit what information Facebook might be sharing with the NSA. Well, it declined, citing safe harbor. But the matter was referred to the European Court of Justice. And last October, that court in, invalidated the, the decision to enable safe harbor. So regulators need to decide how to act in light of this decision, and lawmakers are still negotiating a replacement trade deal. But their determination could affect tech giants, including Google, Apple, Facebook, all these whose uh, cloud services rely on such transfers as well as thousands of smaller businesses who have outsourced payroll processing, for example, and other tasks to U.S.-based organizations. Maybe you use Amazon Cloud Services or something like that. Well, here's the thing. The data protection authorities are expected to make their views known tomorrow at the end of a two-day uh, event, which is actually already underway. All right, more than 40 miles of roads in Coventry will be equipped with technology to aid autonomous vehicles, the government has announced. It's one of, the, uh, it's one of eight projects aiming to develop driverless car technologies, which will receive a share of £20 million from the government's £100 million Intelligent Mobility Fund. Another uh, of the projects will focus on driverless shuttles for the visually impaired. Now, that makes sense to me. So, you know, if you can't see and you still need to get around, kind of cool to have autonomous vehicles for that purpose. Autonomous vehicles are already being tested in a number of areas in the UK. Professor Paul Newman from the University of Oxford co-founded driverless car research company Oxbotica. Sounds like a, like a bad guy. Oxbotica. Watch out. For Oxbotica. All right, they are going to receive some of the new funding, but he says it's part of the strategy that the UK is unfolding to support the future of transport. The funding would support the testing and development of software for self-driving vehicles, uh, and it's all about vehicles knowing where they are and what's around them. Big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to the Category 5 TV Newsroom. If you've found a news story that you'd like to send, please email newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the Category5.tv Newsroom, I'm Robbie Ferguson. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. It's episode number 437, and it's, uh, it's really nice to have you here. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, I want to say hi to Chris Lee, 2511, who traditionally joins us uh, through YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Category 5 TV, or me, myself, uh, at Robbie Ferguson. Uh, nice to have you here, uh, Chris, and uh, everyone else who's joining us as well, Agamotto, and uh, I want to say hey to Dennis Kelly as well, who's been a, a big help uh, this week in getting us set up as uh, the Pixel Shadow has been launching its first ever actual branded server uh, for mind test playing. So if you want to check that out, uh, load up mind test and uh, that's a free alternative to Minecraft. You can get it for free at mindtest.net, M-I-N-E. 
T-E-S-T, and uh, connect to tps.cat5.tv, and the port is the default 30,000, and uh, that is going to be displayed this Sunday on the, uh, on the Pixel Shadow. All right, folks, this is the show, and we are going to get into the Raspberry Pi. Not the Pi, but the Pi, P-I. It's a little microcomputer. You see all these wires on my desk? This is cool. All right. Check it out at cat5.tv slash pi. Uh, this is a, uh, it looks like a little circuit board, but it's actually a microcomputer, and it's got a lot of cool features. HDMI output. It's got, um, it's got USB ports, four USB ports. It's got, uh, this is the Pi t- uh, Model uh, B Pi 2, and uh, this has got the Ethernet. It's important. I mean, some people have looked at um, the the various versions of Pi. I think that it's important to have that Ethernet port, especially if you're going to be using it as a server. You want the reliability and the consistency of Ethernet versus just going with Wi-Fi, for example. It's also got audio output. So you know that on a previous feature, we in fact created a Raspberry Pi powered audio server, a music server for an office. And uh, that was really cool. But right now what we're doing is we're creating a Raspberry Pi powered Apache web server running on Debian Jesse Linux. So there's a, a little something that you need to know about the Pi. First of all, by default, its operating system is going to run on one of these little guys. And can you believe, like, can you even see that? It's so tiny. And I know this is not news to you, but if you've been in in computers for as many years as I, it still impresses you that a micro SD card, this one is only 16 gigs. I've got larger ones as well, uh, but they are so tiny. And this is 16 gigabytes of storage. But the Raspberry Pi operating system, Raspbian, is only going to use about, I think about a gig, maybe a a couple of gigs of that by default. So you're going to run out of space really quickly. So what we're going to learn to do tonight, uh, we're going to backtrack a little bit. I've already showed you before how to install Raspbian, but tonight we're going to redo it because tonight we're going to also take that extra step of configuring our Raspbian operating system. I've done a little more research since the last time we did it, and there are some easier ways to go about it. And so I thought, hey, let's, let's do this. One of the things, as I mentioned, is the size of the, uh, the partition, how big the file system is uh, on that system. And so we're going to fix that up. There is documentation that makes it so overly complicated. We're going to do it in like five minutes flat. It's, it's super, super easy when you know where to check. So I'm just going to hop on over to, uh, to this computer here. I've got a, another system right over here. And on this system... Let's bring it up. There we go. I'm kind of manning all of the buttons tonight, so hopefully uh, you're able to follow, and hopefully this works well on your on your screen. Um, so this is just a Linux computer, and I'm going to show you how we can go about this. So let's bring up our web browser. We're going to go to raspy, uh, Raspberry Pi dot org. Nope, that is oh look at that oh data. You this is what we're up against, folks. Uh, data usage notification, you are approaching another $50. Do you want to accept? There we go. Not authorized. Okay, I'm, I'm authorized. RaspberryPi.org. Let's try that again. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Unfortunately, we've had some technical difficulties. Our ISP cut off our internet there for a moment. We got it back up and running, and then we've had all kinds of grief since that time, um, being that we're live. Uh, sometimes uh, these are unforeseen. Those who have been watching live kind of got to learn what was going on. But uh, for those of you watching on demand, uh, we're unfortunately not going to be able to resolve our issues this evening uh, in time to be able to uh, perform the rest of the feature. So we're going to pick that up again uh, next week, and we're going to get that uh, we're going to get that done for you. We're going to be setting up the Raspberry Pi. I'm going to show you all about how to do this on Linux, how to expand the file system. I'm really happy to be um, showing you these kinds of things. Unfortunately, um, sometimes there are technical issues and it's fairly rare that uh, that we have to cut off uh, a feature like this but unfortunately there's no getting past it and we've tried chat room knows that uh, we've tried over and over tonight and unfortunately it's just not happening 
Um, so, um, in the meantime, so next week, uh, we're going to pick this up on episode number 438. Folks, it's nice to have you here in chat room. Thanks for sticking it out with me and, and doing our best to, um, to get through this. We've had some interesting conversations through, you know, trying to d- diagnose what was going on. Um, I, th- I think the chat room knows where we're going with it, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun next week. So, uh, thanks, SoundPro69. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will definitely do this again. So, backing up, what are we doing? All right. So, we are not F-disking the drive, per se. We are going to be DDing the, um, the image that we're downloading, the Rasb- Raspbian um, distribution, which is Debian for Raspberry Pi. So we're going to actually be using DD to place that on our uh, micro SD card, which may or may not be damaged. Um, we're having some problems with our SD card after all the kinds of things that we've had tonight. Um, so I'm going to look at that this week. Once it's DD'd, the problem is is that Raspbian by default is only going to use a very small portion of the space on your uh, micro SD. So what we had happen as I was going through tutorials with setting up the the Raspberry Pi as a web server uh, what happened is is I was installing MariaDB and the card said it was full so it then corrupted some files and had some problems and then I found oh well I did a DF-H and realized that my hard drive flash drive the the partition was only like 256 meg on a 16 gig flash drive so I realized oh there's an extra step. We need to expand the file system because the image file was created on maybe a, a smaller uh, micro SD card before they placed it for download, which makes sense because then it makes it for a faster download, I suppose, although they are zipping it. So we're going to uh, be doing it in such a way that we're going to expand that file system, but I'm gonna, I promise you this, it's going to be brutally easy. <laughs> I say that with all the difficulties that we've had tonight. But it is going to be a lot easier than the traditional way of using FDisk to remove a partition, expand it, create a new partition, and then uh, hope to goodness that uh, your files are still there when you boot it up. It's going to be incredibly easy. So uh, next week, we're going to pick it right back up. Chat room, do you have any more questions for me? I know that we are under time as far as the on-demand video goes, and I apologize for that. If you have any quick questions for me, uh, I do have your emails, and uh, and I wanted some of them have to do with the Raspberry Pi. So I think that it's um, something that we can cover um, alongside of this feature. I do have an email here though from Walter. Walter was watching um, the the interview um, with Mr. Zorin as we were talking about Zorin OS. It says, I enjoy your program, especially the reviews of different tech products and Linux distributions. Um, do, in doing reviews of the Linux distro, such as the recent Zorin OS, I feel a couple of important things can sometimes get missed. Examples. In the system menu, is it possible to enlarge the font? Secondly, is the mouse pointer size scalable to, uh, to enlarge the pointer? These may not seem like important items, however, for users with visual difficulties, these are indeed very important. I find that uh, frequently what can be adjusted is the speed of the pointer, but not the actual size. I guess that is why Linux Mint Cinnamon continues to be my choice. Thank you from Walter. And Walter, uh, thank you so much for the email. And you raise a valid point that sometimes we do overlook um, certain accessibility features because uh, maybe they're not um, as widespread. But, um, but yeah, it's good to know that uh, those are things that you're looking for. Um, one of the things about Zorin OS, and we were talking about it um, on the show, is that it continues to use something called Compiz. And that's becoming um, something that is getting harder and harder to, uh, to get your hands on uh, because it's, it's kind of a discontinued product. What Compiz gives you is desktop effects. So, Walter, um, for example, I'm just going to bring up a, a window here. Um, th- this is Compiz. The ability to zoom, which is a great accessibility feature. Um, th- this is also Compiz. Okay, and I can move around my screen. So Compiz, uh, being that it's included in um, Zorn OS, means that you have access to these accessibility features that are included with 
comp is. So there's a tool called CCSM, and you can always run that on your system. And this gives you all those accessibility features. Um, and a lot of them have to do with the mouse cursor, zoom, and things like that. Um, there's a, a, one of them is called show mouse, for example. Increases the visibility of the mouse pointer. So let's, let's see what that does. I'm going to click on it. Uh, radius, does that do it? Okay, so initiating it is super K. Okay, so that gives me, what is that? Oh, that is, it's like spinning around my mouse. That's very different. That's not like what you're looking for. That's fancy, eh? <laughs> is there just, but you can see what I mean. Like this is what you need is, is uh, not necessarily fire around your mouse. Wow. There's a, a feature to allow you to make it, uh, to make everything negative. Maybe that helps you to be able to see. Uh, but CCSM, Compiz Config Settings Manager, is a tool that you can install on any system that has Compiz, and that will allow you to configure all these accessibility features as well as the cool effects. Indeed, those are there too. Uh, and I believe you would be able to change the mouse cursor size as well. Um, there's position polling, things like that. So uh, anyways, check it out. And comp is, is, is what you want to look for. Thank you for the email, Walter. And uh, this is Category 5 Technology TV. Hey, sorry for having to cut it short tonight, folks. And uh, I appreciate you tuning in. And I will talk to you again next Tuesday night. We're going to pick it right back up. And uh, I'm going to get this issue resolved. And uh, we'll go from there. Don't forget, uh, one of the ways that you can support us is through Patreon. Patreon.com slash Category 5. It would help us out a great deal if you could pitch in. Um, one of the things that we had happen tonight was that we went over our bandwidth restriction on our, our LTE internet service. And uh, as terrible as that is during a live show, it's inevitable that, uh, that we've, got to, um, we've got to cover those bills. So thanks, folks. And uh, I will talk to you again next Tuesday night. Thanks for being here. And uh, have a fantastic week. See ya.